Douglas Mawson chose for his expedition a 2,000 mile swath of Antarctica, all of it unknown. He actually says in his diary, I have no hope of making it back. Amazingly, a verse came into his head. Just have one more try, it's dead easy to die. It's the keeping on living that's hard. Here's one of the great stories in exploration history that deserves to be better known. In January 1915, Douglas Mawson spoke to the National Geographic Society 98 years ago. So it's a wonderful tradition that the society has of speakers who we're still celebrating a century later who actually came and spoke to the society. Mawson was the contemporary of Scott, Shackleton, and Amundsen, and has been eclipsed ever since by those three great figures. And I think there's three reasons for it. The first is that he was Australian, and sadly, we in the Western Hemisphere and in Europe have always looked at Australia and Australian deeds as way out there on the periphery. The second reason is that, unlike those other three greats, Mawson was totally uninterested in going to the South Pole. He saw that as completely arbitrary and, and pointless. He was interested in science, and science to him meant collecting everything in sight and exploring unknown land. So Mawson chose for his expedition not a quest for the pole, the South Pole, but a, a survey as complete as possible of a 2,000 mile swath of the continents directly south of Australia. Completely unknown land, so unknown that it was a flip of the coin whether it was actually land at all as opposed to a series of little rocky islands surrounded by sea ice. And finally, the reason he's neglected or not so well known today is that he, he returned to Australia with, with the, the greatest survival story ever at the same time as the news about Amundsen and Scott's race to the pole was circling the globe, and the tragic story of Scott reaching the pole a month after Amundsen, but dying with his four companions on their return march. This so captured not just the British audience, but the, the attention of the public world over, worldwide, that Mawson was sort of eclipsed by this, and has been ever since. The famous studio portrait of him, taken when he was 28, the, the quote from the Washington Post is mine, impossibly handsome. <laughs> he was six feet three with sparkling blue eyes, and, but he was also a great, he was as great a leader of men as Shackleton. The photos from here on are Hurley's. And Hurley was a young, up and coming Australian photographer who attracted Mawson's attention but uh, almost didn't go on the expedition because, Ma because his, Hurley's mother wrote Mawson a letter saying, for God's sake, don't take my son on the, on the expedition. He'll never survive. He's in very poor health. <laughs> and without Hurley knowing, mom had written this letter. <laughs> so Mawson grilled and examined and questioned Hurley at length and finally decided to let him come along. And history is much the richer for it. Most of the other members were so green, they'd never been on expeditions before. They averaged in age only about 24. A lot of them were university graduate students of Mawson's and others. Something like a third of them had never seen snow. <laughs> and there's not a lot of snow in Australia. <laughs> and they, they say things like, in their diaries, on their first, first days on shore, my first day in a sleeping bag. <laughs> When they got to Cape Denison, they had a snowball fight. <laughs> uh, they were like kids. They were like frat boys, you know, running wild. One of their first favorite occupations was to push penguins off the cliffs into the water. <laughs> so he set out with 38 men, 31 men, in late 1911 with a completely radical new plan for how to approach Antarctica. The plan was to use as a way station halfway between Antarctica, uh, Australia and Antarctica, Macquarie Island, a long time sealing station, a fairly desolate place in its own right, but where he hoped to drop off five men to 
erect radio masts and transmitting equipment. Mawson hoped to be the first expedition ever to have radio contact with the outside. And he had, it was a brilliant plan that, that was wrecked by some very strange factors I'll get into later. The, the ship having dropped off the five minute Macquarie w went straight south hoping to find a good anchorage on the continent itself. And all they found was ice cliffs. So they kept skirting west and west and west looking for any kind of an inlet. And meanwhile, the ship got terribly iced up every day. Finally, they came to a plausible inlet which they named Commonwealth Bay. Unwittingly, it turns out to be the windiest place in the world at sea level. The, the summit of K2 may be windier, but uh, scientists 70 years later proved that the, the winds here are si literally the fiercest and most continuous anywhere in the world, I any other part of Antarctica, any other place in the world. And this created tremendous stress and, and hampered all of the research efforts of the team. Uh, to give you an idea what that means, the, in the month of May 1912, which is one of the coldest and darkest months in the Antar Antarctica, the average wind velocity day and night, 24 hours a day for a month was 60.7 miles an hour. I mean, some of you have been in 60 mile an hour winds for a few hours. It's rough. I love this photo of, of a, <laughs> Bunch of penguins right after a, a blasting sleet storm. The, the poor guy on the left doesn't know what hit him, and the others, <laughs> the others are wondering what hit, hit him too. <laughs> All they can do this waning summer and early autumn of 1912 is make reconnaissances. The big expeditions are going to happen next summer, so they have to winter over. Then the, the autumn wanes and winter sets in. But inside the hut, you could have a certain coziness and camaraderie. They, they always centered around the gramophone. And Mawson was very collegial. He would share messes with, with his men always and was one of the guys. And you get a sense of how beleaguered the snowpack made living in the hut. You couldn't get in the doorways after a while, so you had to climb out these escape hatches in the roof. That's the actual doorway, which is turned into a tunnel of snow. This illustrates the difficulty of working in the wind. Hurley called this wind walking. He said that you could wind walk in an 80 mile an hour wind. This is maybe 80 miles an hour, but 100 miles an hour, it knocked you flat. Hurley shot a lot of these. This is a guy who's just gone out for an hour to check the wind gauge and other scientific instruments. And by the time he gets back into the hut, that's what his hood and face look like. Most of the work was man hauling sledges with makeshift sails to help. And Mawson divided all his 18 men into three man parties that would go out every which way. The simple point was just to discover new land, go every direction possible. Finally, the next summer came. Six parties set out in six different di directions, three man parties, all of the man's man hauling, except the three man team that was the most ambitious, led by, by uh, Mawson. His two teammates were Xavier Mertz, pictured here, a 28 year old lawyer from Switzerland, and also the Swiss national ski jump champion. He was a great athlete. They all said he was the best athlete on the expedition. He was the only guy who knew how to ski. And the third member was a 26-year-old British soldier in the Royal Fusiliers named Belgrave Ninnis, who was nicknamed Cherub for his youthful complexion. But he was a great favorite of the whole team. So these three set out on the Far Eastern journey, which aimed at going 350 miles to the southeast to try to link up with the land that Scott had discovered in, Ross, in the Ross Sea the year before all of it unknown. These pictures are not actually from the expedition itself because, as I explained in a minute, no photographs survived from the three-man party. But these are Hurley photos of the very kinds of obstacles they had to overcome. An ice fall like this is tough enough to just climb through with an ice axe, let alone try to get sledges and dogs through. And the big threat was crevasses. 
An open crevasse like this is no problem except you have to find a way around it. But the really fiendish thing was a hidden crevasse, one covered by a snow bridge, so it's almost invisible, but which you can plunge into if you break through the snow bridge. We set out in the early November from the main base hut. They're having all kinds of problems here, lots of crevasses, scores of crevasses they cross successfully. They get out here, they're five weeks out, December 14th. They're going across what looks like an absolutely ordinary crevasse, and uh, Mertz in the lead scouts ahead, waves back, there's a little crevasse here. Mawson makes a signal back to, Nin uh, to Ninnis. Mawson took the dirty job. He took the second sledge with all the less valuable equipment on it, figuring that if anybody broke through, it would be he and his sledge and his dogs, the worst six dogs, and that the really precious stuff with Ninnis would, would be safer coming second. But they cross the, this ordinary crevasse. Mertz looks back in alarm. Mawson looks back, and there's no sign of Ninnis. They, they go right back to the edge, and here's a sudden hole punched in the, 11 feet across, punched in the snow bridge. And they look down into this gigantic chasm. And all they can see 150 feet down is a, a single dog groaning, its back broken, resting on a snow ledge. Another dog dead, a few pieces of broken parts of the sledge. No sign of Ninnis, no sign of the sledge, the rest of the gear. The, they shout for three hours. They don't have a rope to get down in there. They string together all their cord just to figure out that it's 150 feet down. Uh, they suddenly realize what a predicament they're in because on that sledge was um, all the dog's food and all but uh, one and a half weeks of men's food. So they're five weeks out. 300 miles to get back. They take a route farther south, hoping to avoid the worst of these glaciers. They've got six dogs, the six weakest dogs. They're each playing out. They pull as hard as they can, and then Mawson or Mertz has to shoot the dog, feed part of it to themselves, part of it to the other dogs. By the time they get to here, there are no dogs left. They're manhauling. They only have a scraps of food, a little bit of chocolate, raisins, uh, tea, and they're still more than 100 miles out. Mertz, at this point, cannot, cannot sledge anymore. He just lies in the tent and says, I can't go today, we'll try it tomorrow. And this drives Mawson mad. He says, I, I think I could make it back myself, but, but I can't abandon my comrade. Finally, on January 8th, uh, Mertz goes into a delusion. He starts hysterically swinging his arms around, breaks a tent pole. Mawson sits on his chest to hold him down. Mertz is screaming in German, unintelligible words, and then he, he dies in the night. Mawson waits till morning, buries him under a cache of snow blocks, and now realizes that he has 100 miles to go with almost nothing left, and he managed to cut the sledge in half. He was able to get his supplies onto this and manhaul it, but he actually says in his diary, I have no hope of making it back alive. But what drives him on is the idea that if I can only get my, my diary and Mertz's diary to somewhere and cache it, and some, sometime later searchers will find the diaries and learn what happened to us, that's worth the struggle in its own right. I, I can't illustrate this because, as I say, Mawson had to throw away his camera and his film packs. So sadly, there are no pictures of this ultimate survival story. Um, his hair was coming out in clumps. His skin was festering, boils forming all over his face. Um, he, about three days out, he takes off his socks, which he hasn't taken off for days, and discovers to his horror that his soles have detached from his feet. They've turned into these hard and almost leather-like uh, skins that are no longer attached to the, the, the fleshy, the flesh underneath or up above. Well, on January 17th, only about 20 miles of the 100 back, 
on the way back, he falls into a crevasse, and a really bad one. And he plunges through a snow bridge. He's attached to his, to his sledge by a 14-foot rope. And he anticipates the end. And the sledge is pulled towards the edge of the crevasse. If it goes in with him, he's suffering the same fate as Ninus. He's, it's, it's gone and nobody will ever find him. S miraculously, the sledge catches in the snow and acts like an anchor and holds him. But Ninus, uh, uh, Mawson is hanging, dangling free. He can't, his feet can't even touch the edges of the crevasse. He's 14 feet down. He actually thinks about slipping out of the harness and ending his life rather than dangling and suffocating. His first thought is a great regret that he didn't have a chance to eat the very last of the food. <laughs> and, but he finally decides to summon up an effort, this extreme effort. So he pulls, he tied knots. Thank God he tied knots in the harness rope. So he grabs a knot, tries to go hand over hand. He's completely debilitated. He gets no purchase from the sides of the walls. And after this tremendous effort, he pulls up onto the surface, only to have the lip break back again. He plunges all the way down to the 14 feet. And this time, in true despair, uh, anticipates the end. Says, so this is the end, he says to himself. Um, what pulled him out, he says, is two things. His trust in providence, and whether by that he meant God is unclear, but he talks about providence over and over again. Providence always helping him. But amazingly, a verse from Robert Service came into his head, which is... Um, let me quote it. Just have one more try. It's dead easy to die. It's the keeping on living that's hard. That's what made the difference for him, the keeping on living that's hard. He made this second effort, tried to pull himself out, and completely exhausted, did what we climbers call a, a heel hook. He pulled his feet up onto the surface before the rest of his body and used his heels to yank the rest of his body up and crawled up onto the shelf, passed out because he woke up two hours later covered with new snow. Anyway, he uh, it still took, took him another 20-some days to get back the last 80 miles to the hut. And at the end, he's stuck in an eight-day storm at Aladdin's cave, only five miles from the hut. And he's thinking about that January 15th deadline. It's long past. He thinks, will there be anybody at the hut, or will it be gone? And on February 8th, he comes back to the hut. The men, there's six men who have been left to search for him. And the men see him and run up the slope and embrace him, and they can't even tell which one he is. He's so emaciated and wasted. Mawson missed the ship, the relief ship, by five hours. So those seven men are condemned to a second winter in Antarctica. But they have the radio. They brought a new radio operator. The mast never worked the first year because they got blown down by the winds. They got sturdier masks. At least they're going to have contact with Australia. They get two or three weeks of blissful contact. They learn about Mawson actually is able to exchange telegrams with his fiance. They, they learn about Scott's demise. They learn about cricket matches in Australia <laughs> and horse races. And then the radio operator, Sidney Jeffries, goes insane. And he ends up completely refusing to broadcast. He's the only guy who knows how to work the radio. He ends up vacillating through the whole winter between the conviction that the others are going to murder him and the attempt to murder them. Can you imagine the second winter with the constant tension of, of a crazy man who is your only hope of radioing to the outside world? It gets so tense they have to keep a day and night watch on Jeffries. Finally, in November, early summer, late spring comes again. The men are, are, are just frantic for the return of the ship. They write things like, 100, only 100 days till the ship comes. 
Finally, the aurora does come and pick them up. They go back to Australia, and Mawson is immediately greeted as a tremendous hero. He is knighted by George V. Sidney Jeffries sadly spends the rest of his life. He lived to 1942 in an insane asylum. But all in all, what an incredible story. What, what a great survival story. What an amazing expedition. Well, I hope you become as enthralled with this amazing trip as I did and emerge as I began with the greatest admiration for one of the great exploratory heroes of all time, Douglas Mawson. Thank you.